Welcome back, everybody, to Elevating the Sparks. Nice to learn with you for some time on a Monday night. Um, we're approaching Log Omer in just a couple of days. So it's actually in a good time to learn about some of uh, Hasidic Torah. And Log Omer is going to come up in our presentation. Um, so um, I'm excited to learn with you. A brief review of what we did last time. What I tried to show last time was that the Hasidic movement was a response to a particular era in Jewish history, a very difficult era in Jewish history. To a Jewish, it was a response to a Jewish people who felt betrayed by history, persecuted, disconnected from God, like history had left them behind, who had been disappointed by false messiahs, who while the rest of the world was advancing and becoming enlightened, they were still persecuted, felt that they needed something. There was just this feeling of disconnect. And the Hasidic movement was a response to that feeling of just being lost in the world, the feeling of sorrows and, and sadness. The Jewish people in the time of the late 1600s and the beginning of the 1700s experience. Um, and what we tried to show last week, very briefly, and it's, it's a, there's a lot more to say, and it, and it gets pretty complicated as we'll study together, is that Hasidut, the idea primarily of, of, of Baal Shem Tov and Hasidus is that every person, regardless of how well-educated or not as well-educated, regardless of whether they've lived a pure life or a sinful life, Every person, wherever they are, no matter what they're doing, can connect intimately with God. That's essentially the idea. And to reinforce that idea, um, the Hasidic movement began with certain practices, with a certain emotional outlook, and with certain teachings. So today what I want to do is to talk about the founder of the movement, which will again also lead to how this whole thing started. And that is Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. And so to do that, I'm going to share a brief PowerPoint presentation with you. I hope you'll be able to see it. Just one moment. Here it is. I haven't begun the slideshow yet. We'll go to my first slide. And we'll begin from there. Thank you, please. Sorry. Slideshow. From begin. Okay, beautiful. Do we see? There's a picture on the right here. This might be the Baal Shem Tov. It might not be. I found it online um, from uh, the Jewish Virtual Library. So here we go. What do we know about the Baal Shem Tov? So the Baal Shem Tov was a legend. That's why I entitled this year the Baal Shem Tov, the life, the, the myth, the legend. The Baal Shem Tov was an absolute legend. The best that we had, which is closest to what you might call a biography, is a work written in the 18th century called Shidchei Habesht, literally translated, Praises of the Baal Shem Tov. It is a really, really long work, okay? Like really long, and it's filled with the stories of this Rabbi Yisrael ben Elazar, and it just describes his father's life and then his life and, and, and in a very elaborate way. The Baal Shem Tov became such a legend that it's almost impossible to determine what in that is historical and what in that is more mythical. There's just so much myth associated with persona. He's such a gigantic figure, had such an impact and gathered so many followers so quickly that they're just developed this incredible incredibly legendary tale of his life. And all these legends are contained within the Shivchei Abesh. So it's very hard to know exactly what the historical details were of his life, but different historians um, throughout the ages have tried to sort of put together some of the details of his life. It's a lot of mystery. And I'd like to share some of those with you. Just before we go into that, Baal Shem Tov means owner of a good name, but specifically a Baal Shem was a common or not so common, but was a type of figure that took that existed in the community. A Baal Shem was someone who was a sort of medicine man who 
they believed in those times was able to heal people with either alternative forms of medicine or through these amulets with the writings of God. And the, the Baal Shem Tov ended up being one of these figures, one of these medicine men who would give advice to people and try to heal them either emotionally or spiritually or, or physically. So that's where the name Baal Shem comes from, but that, that wasn't his name. And as we go through this history, I just want to give credit to some of my sources. There is one um, really great article that's available online, written by a rabbi, Dr. Yitzhak Alfasi, who is both a rabbi and an academic historian and had a particular interest in Hasidic masters, and also a very helpful book that I have named by Rabbi Arya Kaplan. For those of you who don't know, Rabbi Arya Kaplan was an incredible, incredible Jewish thinker, an absolute genius, a physicist who found Judaism later in life and really wrote just an encyclopedia of, of, about, of Jewish thought. And he's myriad volumes and really um, complex treatments of deeper Jewish thought. One of those books is um, called Hasidic Masters. And I have some of his material here as well. So let's begin with the story of the Baal Shem Tov. The story begins with a miraculous birth. Miraculous birth. The Baal Shem Tov's parents were very old when they had him. So the story goes. He's the son of Eliezer um, and Sarah, who, according to the Shivchei Abesh, had him when they were close to 100 years old. These were his parents, 100 years old. And he's born in Okopi, Ukraine. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. According to the story, it's near Moldavia. It's in uh, Eastern Ukraine in 1698. So there is a myth or legend, however you describe it, in terms of the background of his birth. Obviously, Eliezer and Sarah were barren for a very, very long time. They never had children, but they were very righteous. And Eliezer was known for his his hospitality toward guests of all sorts. And the story goes that he was tested by the sea. The Sultan himself disguised as a wayward Jew who on the Sabbath violated Shabbos. He was Machal al Shabbos. And the Satan wanted to test to see if Rabbi Eliezer, this, this Jew, would invite him anyway. And the story goes that he did, and he had him for Shabbos. He invited him into his house. And in that merit, he was blessed to bear the Baal Shem Tov as his son. So that so goes the story of his dad. He is orphaned at a very young age. As I mentioned, his parents are very old when they had him, and they died very early in his life. And the story goes that his father's last words to him were, fear nothing but Hashem. Fear nothing but God. That was his dying wishes. So that is the story of the miraculous birth of the Baal Shem Tov. One thing that you will see in this sort of legend is that it's marked by hardship. It's marked by very difficult circumstances. He does not have an easy life by any stretch of the imagination, and he manages to persevere through all the hardships. So he was an orphan, and he had no parents. And at first, the story goes that the community supports him, but at some point, you know, when you're supporting someone, it becomes difficult. There wasn't a wealthy community, and so they no longer wanted to support him, so they gave him a job. Not an illustrious job. He became a school monitor. What is a school monitor? He wasn't the teacher. He wasn't the Rebbe in the school. He wasn't the Malamid. His job was to escort the children from, uh, from their houses to the school. He would walk them back and forth. That was a very simple job. And story goes, again, take it for what it's worth. The story goes that while he would escort these children to school, he would do it enthusiastically. And he would teach them how to pray and how to daven. And he would lead the children in prayer and song as they were walking to school. And the Shivchei Habesht, this uh, storybook about his life, describes how the melody was so powerful of these children singing with their monitor, Yisrael, that it brought more pleasure to heaven than the songs of the Levim in the Beit HaMikdash. 
That's how beautiful the melody was. But again, just a very humble job of being a school monitor. Story also goes to share one legend with you that at one point while he was walking to school, someone caught wind of this and was very upset. And the sorcerer um, conjured up a wild animal that to attack the children. The parents were all scared that their children were being attacked by this wild animal while they were being escorted to school. And the Baal Shem Tov remembered what his father had said, fear no one but Hashem. And he reassured the parents that uh, nothing would happen and he would take care of the children. And then and one day they're attacked by this wild animal and in a miraculous swoop of strength, the Baal Shem Tov confronts the animal and kills it on the spot. And then the sorcerer dies. And so he saves the children on their way to uh, school. But that was his life. He was a very humble beginning. Ultimately, he serves as a caretaker in the Beit Midrash. Again, not a rabbi, the caretaker, the shamus. He would open it up in the morning. He would close it at night. He would watch while the students would learn in the Beit HaMidrash. And while they were there, he sort of would doze off a little bit and do his own thing. But at night, he would learn all night. Because again, he didn't have a very demanding life. This was his job. And so when the children went to sleep at night and they left the study hall, the legend goes, he would spend the whole night learning and meditating at that point in his life. What we find, and I'll, what it's important to emphasize here in the story, is that the Baal Shem Tov was very hidden. The very beginning of his life, he told or revealed to no one anything remarkable or unique about it. It was a very humble life, even to the point that people thought him as almost, you know, a, a failure, someone who couldn't succeed, someone who wasn't gifted or was intellectually, you know, uh, um, inferior. That was his reputation. He, he tried very hard to make sure that no one knew of him. So this goes on for a while, and he's, you know, has these menial jobs, and in his spare time, he's learning and he's contemplating and praying. And the legend goes that there was another Kabbalist at the time. Historically, Kabbalah at that point had been begun to be, be, be studied more from the time of the Ari. The Ravitsa Gloria was studied pretty intensely beginning in the 1500s and 1600s. Actually, after the false Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, there was a lot of hesitancy to study Kabbalah, to study the mystical teachings of Judaism. And it became much less public. And so there were only a few people who studied Kabbalah and they did it privately. And so one of them who went by the name of Rabbi Adam Baal Shem Tov, again, another very interesting story to how this happens. He had a few writings, a few secrets of the Torah. And he wanted to leave them as before he left the world. And he tells his son that he has these writings, these savim, he tells his son to leave them with a certain Israel ben Elazar, because these teachings connect with the root of this person's soul. And so this son of this Kabbalist reaches the town where the Baal Shem Tov lives, and he reaches the study hall, and he hears about this Israel ben Elazar. Where is he? Oh, he's the guy that takes care of the study hall. He's the shamus. He opens it up in the morning. He closes it at night, and he goes to the study hall, and he can't believe that this is the guy that he has to... Uh, he has to leave his father's holy writings. He can't believe it. He can't believe it. This guy's a nobody. He's not like a I'm a, thunk, I'm not a scholar, not a leader. This is the guy who's going to be the inheritor of my, my father's writings. Eventually, he watches him a bit. He sees something special about this guy. And he leaves him the writings with him. And so uh, maybe on a more um, slightly less mythical level, it's seen at this point in the Baal Shem Tov's life, it seems like he rendezvoused with some of the Kabbalists of his time, in secret, while, while no one was really looking. He began to dabble in mystical uh, mysticism and Kabbalah. Okay. So the next point in the story is, this is where he was born. Um, there's a lot of mystery about what happens next. The, in the Sivche Abesh, it says that eventually the townspeople thought he was maturing and he was going on a good path. And they, in those days, they didn't really meet people the way that we do today. So they set him up. They gave him someone to marry. We don't even know her name. And unfortunately, again, tragedy strikes and she died pretty soon after their, his first marriage. 
And so it's possible that in the wake of that tragedy, he leaves his hometown. He leaves Zokup and to travel to Brody. Brody is a town in Ukraine. So it was a long Jewish town. Now, Shilchai Abesh says there he began to develop a little bit more of a reputation of, as, as a Torah scholar, as a teacher. People heard of him and he was more well-respected. So at this point, there is a fellow, we don't know his name, we know, we'll know his son's name in a second, but there's, there's, a, there's a, someone who ends up being his future father-in-law and becomes impressed with him. Story goes that he asked for a halacha, he asked for a halachic ruling, the Baal Shem Tov gives him the ruling, and he's very impressed. And he asks him to marry his daughter. He has this feeling, I think you should marry my daughter, I think this is your suitable match. His daughter, Hana was a divorcee. She was, you know, someone who had, had a failed marriage. And in those times, certainly, um, that was a stigma. To, to, and Hannah probably had, had trouble getting married, remarried. But this, uh, this fellow offers the Baal Shem Tov of his daughter. And the Baal Shem Tov agrees, but he says in the written agreement what we called Sa'im. In those days, there was, before the actual marriage, they would write a little contract to commit to actually marrying. And so the Baal Shem Tov said, I don't want you to write anything about me at all in that written agreement. Don't write anything about me. Nothing. Just, just write this Rizra Albin Al-Azhar is going to marry my daughter. I don't want you to say anything. I'm a Talmachacha. I'm a this. Nothing. Just write the very basic agreement. So the story goes that on his way home from making this agreement with the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov's future father-in-law dies on the path. He dies. And he leaves this writing saying that this Israel ben Elazar is going to marry his uh, daughter Hannah. And so the brothers of Hannah, again, the uh, Baal Shem Tov's future wife, don't want to honor it. They're like, who is this guy? This guy's a nobody. We never heard of him in our life. And why should our sister marry this nobody? And, and, and they didn't want to agree and they weren't happy about it. And so Hannah herself says, listen, I mean, she hadn't met him. Right, but she says it's my father's desire. He must have seen something in this fellow, the uh, Israel ben Elazar. So uh, Israel ben Eliezer. So let, let him write it. Let, 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 I'll marry it. It's good enough for my father. It's good enough for me. And so they get married. And, uh, and the story continues. Right, this 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 woman was was whose her brother was a someone named Rabbi Avram Gershon of Kito. And Rabbi Avram Gershon of Quito was a pretty well-known Torah scholar, and he wasn't too happy about this. So he doesn't want any association with this, this weird Yisrael. Who is this guy? So he sends him away. He sends his brother-in-law and sister away. He purchased a horse for him, and he sent him away. He's like, I don't want you to be, uh, you know, you, you don't need to live around us. They, they weren't so proud of their newfound brother-in-law. And so they sent him away. And the story goes that Yisrael and Hana move to the, the Carpathian Mountains and they eke out a very, very modest living. And they're living in the, away from the community, in the, in the mountains. And there, Rabbi Yisrael would sort of go out into the woods and think and learn and, 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 and be alone and contemplate. And he would do this for very long periods of time, away from being bothered by the community. And he would do this and study and meditate in secrecy. And this went on for a number of years. So until this point, again, this story is marked by tragedy, by difficulties, by being rejected. Some of that is even by design. He doesn't want people to know anything about him. He keeps it all to himself. And again, there's a lot of mystery here, why and what and how, not 100% clear. At some point, at the age of 36, Israel says, it's time to reveal myself. Time to reveal myself to the world. It's time to start sharing my teachings with the world. There are different stories about how exactly this happens. Was it in front of a lot of people? One person, some stories suggest that certain scholars heard about this man in the forest. And they went to visit him. They thought he was a crazy person. And then they see a burning fire. And they thought the house was on fire. So they run into the house to learn that it's not the it's it's not it's not that the house is on fire but it's uh, coming from the fire of the Baal Shem Tov, from his Torah he had his own fire all sorts of stories that relate how this actually happened but the point is that at at on Lag Baomer Lag Baomer of uh, as Rabbi Arya Kaplan tells it at 1734 he decides to reveal himself to the world 
And then he goes to uh, Mezhebuz in Poland. And I have here in the slide the English pronunciation of that, of that, of that place. And he begins traveling around that town and, and, and traveling and teaching and off. People advice. And again, this happened, but there's such a legend with us. And the fact that there are so many Hasidim show us that his reputation spreads like wildfire. See the connection is stable. I apologize for that. Um, his reputation spreads like wildfire, and, and his prominence just grows and grows and grows and grows. And people hear about this, the Baal Shem Tov, this Rabbi Yisrael, he's incredible and he can heal people. And then there's all these stories of miracles and his greatness. And he ascends to heaven to commune with angels and to talk to Eliyahu Hanavi and to talk to Mashiach. And, the, and, and his reputation just absolutely changes the world. And we know around this time, his followers, people who profess to be followers of the Baal Shem Tov, gain themselves following. And within just a couple of generations, this little sect of Hasidim grows into being thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews. And it starts in, it's, it's in Poland, then Ukraine, then Hungary, and it just spreads all over. There's books written about where and how and when this exactly happened, but almost out of nowhere, like from nothing, this nobody becomes this incredibly charismatic leader. And he gains this wild, huge following. And it's in this context that we hear of, uh, of stories of the Baal Shem Tov. I'll just share, I'll share one with you. And then what we'll do for the remainder of our time is we'll learn a few texts of the Baal Shem Tov. One story goes as follows. And yet you can look online. There's tons and tons of stories of the Baal Shem Tov. And as they say, you know, how much of them are literally true? I don't know. But they don't tell stories about like this, about you and me, right? And my Kaplan notes, um, generally, Judaism doesn't have too many figures like this. Meaning, we don't know, we don't celebrate Moshe Rabbeinu's birthday too much. We know he was born and died in Zion Adar. We don't really do too much about Rabbi Akiva or Yeshayahu or prophets. We learn about their teachings. We learn about their writings, right? We learn about their thought, their philosophy. But the terms of the figure, the persona, it's less of a celebration. Baal Shem Tov is a clear um, exception. He was, he was, we don't have much of his writing. We don't have much of his teachings directly. We have his students' writings of his thought, which we'll learn more about in, in, in coming weeks, about some of the students, the Magda Mezrich, of Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya, but we have very few of his writings. What we have of him are stories. We have of him of his, a celebration of whom he was and what he stood for. And so it speaks to whether they're literally true or not. It speaks to the incredible, incredible impact he had on the Jewish world based on the time period that he lived in and how incredibly charismatic he must have been. And um, Dr. Al-Fasi points to the various texts, both from the Hasidic world and not, who were contemporaneous with the Baal Shem Tov and speak of his greatness. So no one, there, a, after the Baal Shem Tov's time, there's a lot of opposition to Hasidus. They may be able to have a chance to talk about why. But he didn't have too many opponents in his lifetime. He was known as this incredible person. So I'll share one story briefly with you. There's loads of them. You can look, find them online in storybooks, plenty of stories. One story goes, there was a fellow named Rav Shabtai who had a wife um, by the name of Perla. I'm getting the story right. And this person was very poor and, and he struggled very mightily, but he had this, this rule. He would never borrow any money. He wouldn't borrow any money, no matter what. And one Shabbos, it's, it's Friday night, and this Rip Shabtai um, uh, um, has nothing. Nothing to his name. He's got nothing, not a penny, nothing to buy anything. He's got nothing. And he says, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not borrowing a cent. I don't want people to give me tzedakah. Rather than you know, throwing myself on the community, I'll live in poverty. So Sir Shatta has nothing to his name. He goes to shul and he's and he's you know, dominating and it takes a while. And the whole time he's thinking, oh, I'm gonna go home to nothing. And so he goes home to his house 
And all of a sudden he sees a table with candlesticks and, uh, and bread on it. And he's shocked and he's all worried. What happened here? And his wife is smiling at him and he's worried. Did my wife actually borrow money? Did she take Sadako? No. So afterward, he, uh, he's, you know, he doesn't say anything. And his wife tells him, no, it was a miracle. I uh, discovered this, this, this garment of clothing in our house and it had golden buttons on it. I sold the golden buttons. And with that sale, I uh, bought everything you see on the table. Okay, that was the story. So far away in Mezhebuz, on the same Shabbos, the Baal Shem Tov, story goes, was, was with the Hasidim. And he was davening and davening. And all of a sudden, he starts laughing. Starts laughing. This Hasidim are looking at him. Like, why are you laughing? It's not something that he would do during the middle of davening. So he says, I'm not gonna, let's not talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Doesn't matter. Why was he laughing, right? So after Shabbos, his shamit um, goes to him and says, Rebbe, why did you start laughing? So he says, let's not talk about it. Get in the chariot. So get in the chariot. They travel very, very far. He doesn't tell them, uh, he doesn't say anything. And they arrive at this house. And, uh, and he walks in the house. And it's this fellow of Shabtai. And he says to him, uh, you tell me what happened to Shabbat. So Shabbat says the whole story. And he says that at some point in the middle of the meal, they just started laughing and dancing like crazy in the middle of the meal because they found this golden uh, button. And that's why the Baal Shem Tov was laughing. The Baal Shem Tov sensed at that moment in time or far away in the village that this, this, uh, this, had, this miracle had happened. And he said that at that moment, the happiness in heaven was incredible. And he says, what can I grant for you? Is there anything I can do for you? And the story goes, this couple says, you know, we never had children. The Baal Shem Tov davened for them the next year. They had a child. There's another, another uh, all these, the, the one story about the legend of the Baal Shem Tov. So what I want to do now is share with you a little bit of what we have. We don't have much of the Baal Shem Tov's writings. Very little survived. He didn't write any formal books. We have the teachings of Rabbi Yaakov Yosef Holmoya, who also known as the Tolos Yaakov Yosef, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tov and wrote his thought organized by sermons on the Parsha. Maybe we'll discover, we'll say some of that next week. But we have two writings that are attributed to Baal Shem Tov directly. We have a letter he wrote to his brother-in-law. Yes, that's the same brother-in-law who uh, wasn't happy with him earlier in the story. Apparently they made up. So we have one letter he wrote to his brother-in-law and we have his ethical will. Those are the two writings we have uh, from the Baal Shem Tov. And Rabbi Arya Kaplan, in his, uh, in his book, translates them. And so I'd like to share a, a few excerpts from them. And when we read this, it's very mystical, it's esoteric. But I'd like briefly, if we could all reflect together and tell me what stands out to you? Or what is the underlying theme of what he's saying? So this is from the letter. He writes as follows. In this letter, it's, it's, a, it's quite a letter, let me tell you. In this letter, he writes how, you know, he ascended to heaven, to Gan Eden, to the lower part of the Gan Eden. He sees all these souls going back and forth and Sadiqim and even, even people who were, who were wicked and did shuva and there's all this happiness and then they ascend to a higher realm in Gan Eden and he goes there and he sees Mashiach learning with with uh, the seven shepherds, like the Yishpizah and Avram, it's like Yaakov and Aaron, uh, Moshe, Yosef, and David. It's just incredible letter how he ascended to heaven. At the end of the letter, he writes as follows. Let your path be toward God. When you pray and study, let my words not forsake you. And here's, the, here's where it gets interesting. And here's, I'd like to know what you think about the paragraph. What do you think it's saying? With every word and expression that leaves your lips, have in mind to bring about a yichud, a unification, right? So this is when you're davening and words come out of your mouth. With those words, you should have in mind to bring about a unification. Every single letter contains universes, souls, and godliness. And as your letters, as they ascend, 
one becomes bound to the other and they become unified. The letters become unified with the divine essence. And in all these aspects, your soul is included with them. All universes are then unified as one and a measurable joy and delight results. Consider the joy of a bridegroom and bride in this lowly physical world. And you will understand how great is the delight. God will certainly help you. Wherever you turn, you will succeed and prosper. And he quotes Mishle, give wisdom to the wise and he will become wiser. And that is this quote. So think for a second here, right? And here's, uh, it's, it's, it's lofty, it's spiritual, it's esoteric. But I want to frame it in, in a way I think is relatable to us. Slightly, at least, slightly. So we pray and we dive. And, um, and maybe you have a lot of things in mind when you dive. The question is, what, what are you trying to accomplish with that? What is the impact of my prayer? What am I really doing when I say these words? I don't know. What does that do? What does that really do? Is God going to just answer my prayer? What if he doesn't? What if I don't get an answer? I don't at least see it. So Baal Shem Tov is saying, is giving us a, a methodology, an image to have in mind when we pray. So let's break it down a little bit more slowly. Right? With every word and expression that le leaves your lips, have in mind to bring about a unification so that when you dive in, picture the letters, literally the letters, Ashrei, I and Aleph, and Reishia, picture them leaving your lips and ascending into this higher realm. Like picture the letters. That's what he's telling you to do. And bring about a unification. What, what, what are we unifying here? What could we be unifying? So this relates to a, and this is actually, I wanted to talk about this. I know, it, because this is why I called this series Elevating the Sparks. Which sparks? There's a Lurianic theory from Yitzhak Luria that God, God is, is, is totally all-encompassing. So how could there be a world? How could there be a world? So, so God had to restrict himself to allow for a world. But that being said, the, the, the belief was and is, and this is a pillar of Hasidus, that there's, there's, there's nitsotso, there's spark of God in everything. There's divinity in everything. And they're, all, they're, they're shattered and they're all over the world. They're all over the universe. These, these sparks of divinity, of godliness. But they've been separated. They've been shattered. And one of our jobs in the world is through our mitzvot and davening and learning is to elevate those sparks and bring them back together. This image of bringing back, of, 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 uh, of, of taking the hidden spirituality and everything, which is now separate, and bringing it up and bringing it back together. And whether you understand what that means, and I don't fully understand it, but the, but the experience of davening is this greater spiritual process that is fixing the world. That's how the Baal Shem Tov sees it. And every letter contains universes, souls, and goddess. Every letter that you say is bringing more spirituality. And then the letters unite. And they create words which are incredibly powerful. And those worlds go up to God's divine presence and they unite you with him. And so that when I say these words in some incredible spiritual process, I'm binding my soul to God's presence. And I can envision the letters of my prayers ascending to heaven and binding me to God and uniting the spiritual, the sparks within the world and elevating them. And when that happens, it's the greatest happiness. It's the greatest jubilation in heaven 
and there's incredible joy. And 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 if and, and it's it's the, the joy of a of a of a wedding is just a, a little a sprinkling of what that joy it is, right? So the point is again very very mystical, very esoteric, but to a simple Jew who can't even understand the words they're saying, right? Baal says, you know what? Don't worry. Every, just, just when you daven and say, I'm trying to bring about a yichud, unification. I'm trying to, to, to connect God to this world, to bring more godliness into the world. And I'm sending letters up to heaven and binding my soul to God. In a very simple way, that those are simple words to say. I don't even fully know what they mean, but they inject the prayer experience with a profound level of meaning and, and connectivity. It's a cosmic impact I'm having by saying these letters. So that's one thought from the letter. And now, again, about prayer, we're about to dive in Mechem Arv, so it's, it's appropriate. Um, I want to uh, share with you this from his will. This is an ethical will um, that the Baal Shem Tov left for his descendants. Um, and he, it's, it's a lot longer than this. This is just an excerpt. He writes as follows. Sometimes you can only worship with constricted consciousness, which in Hebrew is katnis demote. What do you think he means by constricted consciousness? Anyone want to guess for me? Sorry, I hasn't been too interactive. What's constricted consciousness mean when you pray? What do you think that means? Constricted consciousness. Praying with constricted consciousness. What sh well, that's a challenge, right? What, what is that challenge? Maybe like you can't have Kavana, you're just like trying to sit there and pray. And, you try to think of God, you can't. All you can think about is, I don't know, your, your tough day at work. All you can think about is how you're poor and you can barely put food on the table. And you've got so much distractions. You can't think of God at that moment. It's, that's constricted consciousness. You're not connected to anything greater. You're not connected to anything particularly spiritual. And you're trying to pray anyway. He says, then do, yeah, you do not enter into the supernal world at all. You can't, you can't uh, connect to this great experience. Still, you can realize that God is close and that the whole world is filled with it. Even when you're like, you're, you're trying to sit there and pray and you can't think of anything. You're, all, you, all you can think of is how miserable your life is. But remember, God's close. And he's filled, with, the whole world's filled with his glory. In that moment, in that space that you occupy at that time, God is there too. At such a time, you are like a small child whose intellect has just begun to develop. Like you're, like you're, you're praying on a simple level. But even though you are worshiping while in a state of constricted consciousness, again, cognitive demotion, inability to concentrate or to connect to anything greater, you can worship with great attachment. You can still connect to God in that moment. Even though you are in a state of constricted consciousness, if you bind yourself closely to divine presence, you can instantly transport your thoughts to a supernal universe. More than actually in that supernal universe, the person is where his thoughts are. A person is where his thoughts are. That's the Baal Shem Tov tells us Hasidim. You might be in the worst mood and your life is wretched and you think I can't concentrate at all. But if you keep in mind that in that space, God is everywhere. The whole world is filled with his glory and he's close to you then. Even in that constricted mindset, you can still pray with attachment, with fikut, with connection. You can still attach yourself to God. And if you can manage to think of God even in that moment, however wretched your immediate location is, you're transported into a greater place. And that is what the experience of prayer can be. Again, he's not saying anything about the words themselves. He's saying what the experience is. It's meant to be experiential. This mystical experience isn't just about, you know, an elaborate theory. It's about taking your difficult um, challenge of prayer and injecting it with incredible meaning and connection. And I think this Lashal Shanto's life, a difficult life, orphaned at a young age, 
rejected by his community, wandering from place to place, menial jobs, a caretaker of a study hall, a monitor for school children. His first wife passes away. His brother-in-law rejects him. And through that, Baal Shem Tov was just hiding himself until he revealed himself to the world and tried to enable his uh, followers to have that same feeling of connection that he had. So we'll stop here. I hope you found this meaningful and inspiring as you, uh, as you approach Sfila. As you approach Sfila, whether you're in a state of expanded consciousness or constricted consciousness, know that the whole world is filled with God's glory. And regardless of how difficult it is, you can pray with great attachment. Thank you very much for joining everybody.